All right. Everyone hear me okay? All right. Well, I'm really, really excited to be here today talking with you all about lifestyle medicine. My name is Dr. Mariah Stump. I am a primary care physician here at Brown and I'm assistant professor of medicine and clinician educator. So I teach medical students and residents and I'm also a primary care physician trained here from Brown. So I'm also really excited to have a fourth year medical student, Megan Duckworth, with me today, who will be doing part of this presentation and she'll introduce herself in a little bit. And we're really excited to hopefully make this a, sorry, a discussion based so we can really answer just questions at the, the end and really have it be an open forum to talk about really our future of healthcare and lifestyle medicine. So. I have no financial disclosures, really no relationships, and really won't mention any sort of really companies or products or anything when we're talking. Just to give you a little background on myself, like I said, I'm, I'm primary care by training, but I did additional board certification in lifestyle medicine and integrative medicine. So the objectives today, we're gonna to keep this pretty informal, but I did wanna kind of get through a lot. Um, so we're gonna talk about lifestyle medicine generally and we're going to identify really the top five chronic diseases, which can be prevented and in some case nearly reversed by lifestyle alone. So as the title of the talk says, we're in a lifestyle, we're in a crisis in our healthcare system, really. And we have rising, rising chronic disease. So we're gonna discuss really how Brown and other medical schools can really, and really even the Brown undergraduate um, courses can really discuss gaps in nutrition education in, the, in, in our medical training. We're gonna highlight curricular development in lifestyle medicine and showcase really what we're doing here at Brown. And, and, and that involves nutrition education and really discuss future directions and our hopes for making this curriculum longitudinal through, uh, throughout medical school and really hopefully starting at the undergraduate level as well. We're gonna talk about um, what Megan's done while she's been here as a medical student, which is really impressive and really give you some tips for hopefully how to get this, um, the word out um, as a future movement. So we'll dive right in. Has anyone heard of Dr. Mark Hyman? Raise your hands. Maybe Dean Ornish, raise your hands. All right, so these are really the founders and the sort of the fathers of lifestyle medicine, cardiologists, internal medicine docs by training, who really noticed in the course of their careers careers, just sort of how sick their patients were, and they really weren't getting better by the standard of care. So I love this quote, and I love opening with this. Um, food has the power to heal us. It's, our, it's the most potent tool we have to prevent and treat many of our chronic diseases. So food really, really matters, right? What we put into our body really matters. The, the quote on the other side, right, is by everyone knows, you know, who Hippocrates was. So this movement of lifestyle medicine, of really, of really what we're doing with our physical, what we're putting in our bodies, our nutrition, it's not a new concept, right? Nutrition has been around since the beginning of time, right? So we knew, even ancient healers knew that food is medicine and medicine is food. And so this is not, these are not new concepts that I'm presenting, but the way in which we think about them has to reflect where we are socially, culturally and where we are in a healthcare system. So what is lifestyle medicine? So people, even in my field, internal medicine or in family medicine, they're still kind of like, well, wait, what is lifestyle medicine? Is that like functional medicine? Is that integrative medicine? So there's a lot of different stuff floating out there in the lay press. So we're just gonna give you the definition of it. This is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which is a a college and a sort of certifying body of certification for physicians to do additional training. And they're really leaders in, in, in this field. So it's the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approaches, such as a whole food plant-based diet, but I wanna give a caveat that this is not trying to get everyone globally and, and nationally to become vegans, or this is not necessarily a vegetarian movement, okay? But we like to lean into plants a little bit more regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive social connection as a primary therapeutic modality for treatment and reversal of chronic disease. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at this and reading this, you're probably like, well, yeah, this is obvious, right? I think that the funniest thing is that this is so basic, right? This is what good medicine should be. This is what every doctor should be talking about to their patients. This is what, how we all should be living. But unfortunately, our society has changed a lot from our roots, from 
Hippocrates time, and we're not all living off the land. We're not all in situations where we can walk to work or walk to school. And we're certainly not um, in our lived environments as well as we could be implementing these things. And then the social connection piece is we're in the middle of a pandemic. So that's really not helped with cultivating social connection. So sorry, this slide cuts off this a little bit. Sorry about that. But these are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine, just as a visual for those of you who are more visual people, essentially is what I just said. It's focusing on moving more. It's focusing on managing stress and teaching students, medical students, how to self-care. Also, how to teach their patients how to cope with stress. Um, it's forming and maintaining positive relationships in their life, right? And getting rid of some toxic people, potentially, and some toxic substances, right? It's getting sleep and improving our sleep and it's focusing on what fuel we're putting in our body. So these are really the pillars. And like I said, again, they seem really basic, but unfortunately we're not getting back to our roots as you can see with our chronic diseases that are on the rise. So what's the magnitude of the problem and why are we deciding to focus on this today as one of the highlighted um, lectures? So 85% of chronic disease, not just globally, but nationally is caused by unhealthy lifestyle habits which is pretty profound when you say that, right? Even our best medication, our statin, cholesterol drugs, our hypertension medications really can't reverse or control 85% of our conditions. But 85% of it is caused by things that we can prevent. So unfortunately, right, we, we find ourselves in this sort of quandary of really not being in a healthcare system, but being in a sick care system. So when someone comes to me in primary care, unfortunately, right, or when you, when we sort of, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, I'm tasked with like, let's prevent, let's prevent all this stuff. But really what's happening is a lot of times people are getting this treatment after they've had their heart attack or after they've had their stroke. Then we're thinking about how do we, how do we maintain health better? So, you know, we're in, there's a lot of reasons for all of this, by the way, right? Um, but we're in a system where both providers are rushed, right? And physicians, right? It's much easier to pull out a prescription pad, right, and prescribe a medication than to spend the time to talk to patients about these things. We're also in a healthcare system, right, that doesn't reimburse very well for me having a conversation with you about smoking cessation or having a conversation with you about how much you're walking during the day and how much you're moving. So things need to change and catch up, but we're getting there. But also patients, you know, they like quick fixes too. Like if I talk to someone and I say, you know, do you want to, you know, work on, you know, X, Y, or Z, work on your diet, whatever, we're like, just, let's just start the stat. You know what I mean? So, so we're, we're in this, we're in a fast paced world. And we all know that. So chronic diseases though, as I said, are really preventable. If you think about the fact and the magnitude that one in heart, dis heart disease deaths can be prevented by what we put in our bodies, what we eat, right? How much we're moving during the day. And the big one is how much we're managing our stress. You know, like maybe cardiologists won't have a job in 30 years, <laughs> probably not. But if we, if we really focus on this, our whole healthcare system, our whole global healthcare world, it, it could just be like, it's mind blowing, like right? it really could change. So, also, this is taking a toll on our healthcare dollars, right? Our healthcare system. So I'm, I'm not going to present numbers here. I'm not a numbers person, but I will just give you the basics, right? Essentially, this 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 fact. This is from um, the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization that essentially 86% of all healthcare dollars spent are are on chronic disease. That's a lot, right? So, so essentially, you know, like patients are dying of heart disease every day, right? And so, and we're not doing a great job about about treating them. Patients are, diabetes is on the rise, obesity is on the rise, heart disease is on the rise. These things are not getting better, they're unfortunately getting worse. So 80% of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers even, right, could be prevented primarily with improvements in our lifestyle. So these things are important. I think in medical school, you know, sometimes I have to convince the curriculum committee that this isn't soft medicine anymore. This isn't fluff. This isn't stuff that we shouldn't be talking about you know, biochemistry is still important and anatomy is still crucial, but this saves lives, okay? So in 1900, if you look at what's killing people, right, causes of death, in 1900, it was all our infectious diseases, right? Because we didn't have antibiotics developed, right? We didn't have, 
you know, we're still talking about communicable diseases, right? Flu, things like that. So pneumonia. But if you fast forward to 1997, look at heart disease, right? That's leading the way. Cancer is leading the way. Stroke. And if you look at our, um, if you look at our more infectious diseases, we've gotten a lot better at doing a good job about that, right? Um, but we're not doing so well um, about these other chronic diseases. This is not just a national problem in the U.S., although U.S. is leading the way in this as well, right? We like to be global leaders. We're global leaders in chronic disease, so good for us, right? <laughs> Um, but um, essentially, you know, if you look globally, globally countries are catching up with us. They're also this, this movement of moving away from our roots of thinking about the basic things and preventative care is becoming a global phenomenon. So heart disease, stroke, COPD, which is caused by smoking primarily, you know, and we think that essentially, if you look at the blue, these are non communicable diseases, diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia are becoming more and more common. Why? And there's a lot of, a lot of you know, theories out there about why that happens. But again, you know, has, have people really aged that differently over time? Yes, our patients are aging differently because we're living in a different kind of world. We're eating different food. We're not moving. We're social connection is right here on our phone. It's not with people in our community. So the world is changing, and it unfortunately has not been necessarily always changing for the better. So I want to say that this isn't just a movement that we're trying to do inside medicine. I wanted to frame this by saying that this is a nonpartisan political movement. This is a movement also from our government, from our, 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 our leaders are saying, like, what are we doing? They're looking to doctors saying, like, what's going on? Our healthcare dollars are rising. What are you all doing about it, right? So um, the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health was first held in 1969 during Nixon's administration. And that was really transformative. What it did was it actually sort of galvanized action that included the creation of school lunches. It started the WIC program, the Women, Infants, and Child program to give sort of food for those who are underserved, who can't afford food, who had um, little ones to feed. And so um, the SNAP program and how to like read food labels back, you know, back in the day, like you just picked up something and may, you didn't know what was in it necessarily. We figured it was all things that were, you know, things weren't as processed. They weren't as, you know, um, so, so they really started food, food labels back from that conference. The second White House conference was held just like three weeks ago. So in 50, over 50 years, we have not had a conference gathering together physicians, leaders on this and politicians and the, coming together to say like, let's prioritize this because in over 50 years, things are not getting any better. In fact, they've gotten a lot worse. So um, the Biden administration and the Miller administration now actually convened this in 2022, just a few weeks ago. And this is really, really important. This is really huge because I think it says, look, right? We want to prioritize food insecurity. Why? I'm talking about lifestyle medicine and how important it is to eat good food and move, but the problem is, is that in our country, we don't have access to many of these things. Most of our, our you know, patients that we're taking care of, they can't go to the gym, right? It's not available for them to take safe walks. And so how do we you know, coordinate, how do we get a coordinated strategy to sort of accelerate progress in this area and drive change to really end the hunger problem that we still have in the US, to improve nutrition, to um, really get people moving better in a safe way and sort of close these disparities because we're, again, we're really not, not doing well. So this is the mission. Just if you're, anyone's interested in this, uh, you know, um, not necessarily through the medicine route, but if you um, have any, want to do any advocacy or community, community work, they're looking for people to be involved in this in every state. So the White House Conference on Nutrition Hunger um, Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. And so their mission is to end hunger and increase healthy eating and physical activity by 2030. And so that fewer Americans essentially experience diet-related diseases like diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Okay, because again, those three are essentially solely derived from diet. I would say hypertension can be a little genetic. All these have a little genetic component, but people are like, oh, Jack, it doesn't matter. You know, my dad had heart disease. I'm going to have heart disease. No, right? We know that genetically it's a very small component, less, less than 5% of genetics. So, you know, I mean, 95% modifiable, right, by you, that's, that's pretty good odds, right, that you can beat it. But what I'm saying is we're not, we're not operating in a vacuum. 
Right. So I, I love talking about lifestyle medicine, but one of the most powerful questions that I've gotten from my medical students, and they're so right, you know, this is great to talk about, but we have to actually make it possible for people to access these things. Right. So it's it's we're, we're talking about these things in an inequitable society. Right. So just to give you an example. Right. So, you know, equity or excuse me, equality is everybody getting an apple. Right. OK. Apples for everyone. Everyone gets an apple in here. But, you know, equity is actually making it possible, right, for those communities to get apples themselves, right? So lifting up those, right, who don't have any stools to stand on to reach those apples. And so that's really where we need to go with lifestyle medicine. We need to make it more accessible. We need to make this, these programs affordable. We need to make these things more available for our society because otherwise we're never going to get better. And it's better for all. So food security, right? And again, a lot of food insecurity in this country. We don't have access to safe spaces to exercise and work, um, access to food, food deserts. You know, some patients live in areas where within essentially um, a half a mile or mile radius, there are no supermarkets. They can't even get food. It's corner stores that don't sell fruits and vegetables and it's fast food, right? So. So how do we solve this complex problem in a complex world with, with a lot of um, inequity? So we need to change the paradigm. Like I said, we need to transform from a sick care system to a healthcare system. And how do we do that? So it's a big task, right? When you've got patients in front of you, but I would say in lifestyle medicine approach would say that you empower your patients by what? By educating them. Educating them that every single person has the power to change their own behavior. Every single person, right? And how they do that is optimizing, getting those apples, right? Giving them the stools to make sure they can reach for it. If they choose not to reach for it, they choose not to reach for it. We all can make our own decisions. But essentially educating them and empowering them to have the ability to change their own health behaviors. So if you look at this list of coronary artery disease, again, number one killer globally and nationally, and you look at this list, how many of you would say that three of these are modifiable? Three, okay, how many would you say five of them are modifiable? I, yeah, they're all modifiable, right? Pretty much all. So the thing is, all of the risk factors for heart disease are things that we can control. Now, again, a lot of controversy regarding set points for obesity and blood pressure and things like that. And I'm not saying that some of this is not, um, again, genetic, we talked about that, some small component is, but again, it's always able to be changed unless, you know, there, there's always exceptions. So I shouldn't say always, but sometimes people have a particular genetic condition, but you know, type one diabetes, for example, is a different situation. But again, for type two diabetes, right, these are modifiable. So just to look at the obesity trends in the world from 1990 to 2010, how many people have seen these charts? I mean, they're very popular. Every medical student has been like, yes, we know the obesity charts, like scroll forward, right? Okay, but for those of you who haven't seen them, they're pretty powerful. So in 1990, and many of you living, you know, sitting in the audience, remember 1990 very well. You remember what you were doing, you remember where you were, right? 1990 does not seem that long ago for those of us probably over 40, right? So in 1990, the world looked very different, right? As definitely the US looked very different. Um, we don't even have data, but like they weren't even collecting data on obesity in some states. Look, four, state, uh, four states weren't even collecting data. Five, Alaska, okay? Less than 10% of, of national nationally patients were obese. Less than 10%. So 10 to 14%, right? The rest of the country. So fast forward 10, 10 years, and we've got 15 to 19 over in the West and the middle of the USA, right? 20 to 24%. Another 10 years, and we've got 25 to 29 and greater than 30% in this uh, middle and southern part of the US. Like that's a lot of patients. But yet our methods of treating these patients are not changing, right? We're not thinking about this in a different way. So that's the problem. So what's the imperative? So I would say that we're in a crisis and that's the reason of this talk. And so the two crucial questions are, what can be done to help address the current state of affairs through the healthcare system? That would be something that we could all sit around and talk about for weeks, right? Um, it's complex. But who are the change agents? Who are the change agents who have to help lead the way to implement these proposed solutions? I would say it's our medical students. I really believe that. 
I think it's the future of our undergrads, our medical students. These yeah. are the ones, these are the next generations and our current physicians. Our current physicians need to be educated in this as well. It's not enough to just say, well, that's really just not how you've been practicing. No, that has to change. So we're in an imperative to learn lifestyle medicine, to learn these roots, to get back to roots and figure out ways that we can actually treat patients in this new paradigm. So we've had a lack of education in this for years. This is nothing new, but I just wanted to provide a little background. This is a lack of education in formal training at undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate CME. So when I'm trying to go to look for lifestyle medicine, I had to look for it on my own, right? I had to take years to get certified in both lifestyle medicine and integrative medicine because it wasn't offered in um, traditional medical, medical training. So um, tobacco use and cessation, right? And we're graduating our students without really knowing how to counsel patients on getting smoking cessation, how to tell them how to exercise. What's an exercise prescription? Nobody's ever heard of it. Don't you just write prescriptions for drugs? No, you can write prescriptions for other things, it turns out. How to tell, talk to them about that. Wasn't that what a nutritionist is for? Actually, the data shows that people want to hear it from their physicians first. Um, and, and then they'll maybe go to a nutritionist also, but they want to hear it from us too. And how to help patients cope better with their stress. So many people were in a pandemic of anxiety, depression, and stress, right? So, so this is Oxford from Oxford University. NutriTank is like a think, think tank, essentially, for nutrition. And they pulled Oxford University medical students. So this isn't just the US. And this is Oxford University think tank. It's a branch of them um, for community students sort of aiming to help increase knowledge about nutrition and lifestyle medicine in the Oxford student community. And so it's very interesting. So 86% of medical students there disagreed that they have education on nutrition. So 86 disagree. And 88 disagree that medical school prepared them, right? for giving nutrition advice. So we're, we put the onus on physicians, but yet they don't have the training. So that seems, that seems like a problem. So education of nutrition training in medical school. Well, you think, well, okay, well, is this, is this a new problem? Not a new problem, right? So very little training on exercise and nutrition counseling back in the 1970s, but I would argue, right, the, the data kind of reflected that it wasn't as big of a problem. So the medical training was kind of reflecting what the communities needed, right? A lot of communicable diseases discussions, because again, you know, that's where a lot of the, um, the deaths were, okay? They did a survey, I won't go into the whole thing, but essentially, will physicians in 1975 or the future be able to prescribe exercise? And what they found was that they pulled 74 medical students in a, in a questionnaire, and they found that 16% at that time offered a course in preventative medicine or, uh, you know, geared towards exercise. So 16%, I would say, is pretty good if we look at our data in the 2000s. So what's happening is that in 2001, same thing, medical school deans, directors of education, education did a survey. Now they've got 72 out of 121 med 28 medical schools participating. And 6% now um, polling have a reported course in addressing exercise prescription. So our data is going up in chronic disease or we, we saw those data with their obesity, but yet the, the training's going down. So it doesn't seem proportional. 2001, 10% of graduates could design, 10% of graduates could design exercise prescription. So not terrible, but definitely not 100%. Now you would say, well, it's not really that important for a surgeon to be able to describe an exercise prescription. False. It's not really important for a radiologist to be able to talk to a patient about exercise. Maybe not for the patients, but maybe for right his own health, right? So, so I'd say like this does matter for um, for all physicians, not just primary care. Even fewer could counsel on diet and nutrition, right? So cardiologists, interestingly enough, we go to cardiologists. Love cardiology; they're the subspecialty of my field of medicine. So, uh, you know. All due respect, right? But a survey of more than 900 cardiologists revealed that 90%, and this is back in 2017, so it's very recent data, 90% 90, 90 re received minimal to no nutrition training during their fellowship. Well, wait a minute, this is a subspecialty field for in prevention of the number one leading cause of death in the US and globally, and not talking at all about this in their training. That seems like a red flag. Right, so 59% had no nutrition education during their residency. That's the time, you know, before they decide that they want to be, a, uh, as they decide that they want to be a cardiologist. 
and up to a third didn't receive any medical school, as we've mentioned. So only about 8% of cardiologists, right, that were surveyed described themselves as feeling like they were experts in nutrition. And yet they do agree, they agree that they should be the experts, right? They agree that, that their role is inclusive of providing nutrition recommended for patients because they do agree that, yes, we are the ones who should be fighting heart disease and treating it. Okay, so what's being offered at Brown? I wanted to sort of shift gears here and talk a little bit about the exciting stuff that's being done at um, Alfred Medical School. I'm proud to say that we are one of the leaders nationally and right now in our curriculum and nutrition, um, but obviously we still could be doing more, right? And that's our imperative. So in their first and second years, um, medical students can take an elective called Food is Health. It's a, it's a preclinical, so before they're, they're in the hospital, before they're training um, in, the, in the clinical years. And it's normally culinary medicine. So what they do is they partner up with Johnson & Wales, which is a culinary program school, and they go into their kitchens and they learn how to cook, essentially. They learn the basics of how to cook. They learn how to the difference between roasting and boiling and steaming and braising and all of those things and stewing. And what happens to food when you do things that, that way, okay? Um, and how they taste differently and how the nutrients come out and things like that. They also talk about fiber and the connection to the gut microbiome and how fiber, if we increase our fiber, we would cut down on colon cancer rates. We would, um, people, fiber decreases blood sugar, so it helps with diabetes. So there's a lot of clinical connections there. Lower sodium cooking for high blood pressure. They learn the, what does the DASH diet mean? The diet against systolic hypertension, the DASH diet. Right, what does that mean? And then they talk about healthy fats. So it's not just a no fat at all, right? There's a lot of fats that are healthy, um, you know, so and how to cook with those and how do the diabetics approach um, how, to, how to make meals. So really great elective and we're lucky to be able to partner with a culinary school right down the, down the road in Providence. In the third year, they have an opportunity where what's called intersessions. Intersessions are like an all day experience for all third years, right before they sort of start, they're getting out and getting ready to go into the hospital, you know, they're ready to start their clinical rotations. And they had all day with their class to kind of reconvene and listen about some important topics. And so last year, it was really exciting. Lifestyle medicine was featured as well. And so um, among some other topics like gun safety and sex and gender medicine and things like that. So we'll be featured again this year and we do small groups. We break patients, uh, break students up in the groups and we talk about um, a case. And last year we talked about a case of a man who had real cases, by the way, who had erectile dysfunction. And we talk about how ED is actually a marker for cardiac disease. And so um, by actually changing his diet and working on some physical activity, that went away. So, or got better, got better. Um, so, you know, it, this is very interesting to patients because they've never seen it through that lens and students. So the clinical elective, I'm proud to say that um, I'm the course director of, and I, I love this select so much. Megan took this elective, um, and it was its first year started last year, 2021. And actually, in its first year, over 10% of the fourth year students took it. So we had 17, actually I think 18 students ended up taking it. A couple were third years. So what, what we do in this course, just briefly, is the students get to see lifestyle medicine in practice. They come into the clinics, they see men's health, um, they see women's health, they see primary care, and they observe a lifestyle medicine center. We actually have a lifestyle medicine center here through Lifespan. Um, and they look at integrative health practitioners who are hired, you know, who work there alongside of us, acupuncturists and chiropractors, because there's evidence behind what they do incorporated into this lifestyle model. And we talk about, um, nutrition cases and they partner with a nutritionist and go through how would we manage a patient with prediabetes together, things like that. They also look at shared medical appointments because I really believe, and this is not just my opinion, it's um, shared medical appointments are going to be more common. So that means getting patients who all have prediabetes together in the same room and a doctor or healthcare provider leading a group of patients, 10 patients through like let's have a visit all together because everyone can learn together. It's, it's really kind of novel, but up and coming. And I think in the next decade, we're gonna see a lot more of that. And then they also um, have some modules that they do on their own. And then they experience some of this stuff. I have them do some mindful movement. We talk about movement for Parkinson's, how you know movement is uh, a treatment for that. They do some mindfulness, they do some yoga and a, like a walk with a doc program where they can walk with patients if that's happening. So some student feedback, and this, this is really where, you know, this, is, this, is, this says it all, essentially. So some of the students have said, 
I've made changes in my own life because of this elective, and now I feel empowered and confident to teach my patients in a more detailed manner about nutrition, exercise, and sleep. This elective emphasized balance in our own lives as healthcare providers. This course really filled the gaps in nutrition education in my medical school training. I wish I had gotten this course sooner, right? That's the thing I hear so much more. Why didn't I get this so the first year? So they can also do a scholarly concentration. I won't spend too much time on this. It's a little bit more detailed, but they have a, the option of doing research in a sort of an academic sort of rig, rigorous sort of way if they really want to focus, how to make this a focus of their medical education. We have scholarly concentrations in a lot of things and lifestyle medicine and integrative health is one. They apply as a first year and they do a scholarly project um, in their summer and then it's sort of a longitudinal project through, through their four years. And we also have an interest group, which is very active and um, we get speakers um, sometimes nationally renowned to come. And actually one of our, the founding member of our, the, the student who started the Lifestyle Medicine Interest Group, actually Erica Viesi graduated in 2021, um, received a national award for her work for starting this group at Brown. So she's pretty amazing. She's doing medicine in California now in her residency. So we're gonna, I'm gonna hand this off to Megan and she's gonna tell us, share with us her experience and what she's done with lifestyle medicine in her time as a medical student. I'm gonna switch Great. off. Great, thank you, Dr. Stump. Excellent, okay, I now can tell everyone can hear me. <laughs> the three fingers, thank there you. we go. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, I'm Megan Duckworth. I'm a fourth year medical student here at Brown. I'm planning on going into obstetrics and gynecology. I'll be talking to you today about my experience with um, putting lifestyle medicine into practice as a physician in training um, and the many ways you can do that. And Dr. Stump touches on um, some of those ways, and I'll go into detail about one of the projects that I got involved in and then touch on how no matter what specialty you go into, it is really relevant. And I would be lying if I'd said I didn't think about almost every specialty at least once. So um, I will go into that. So um, going to medical school was not something that I thought I would do my entire life. And um, the end of college, I was studying politics and Spanish at the University of Virginia, graduated, was bartending and lived in Ireland and was like, what am I doing with my life? Um, I need to get real. And medicine really came to me as I grew into myself and understood more about um, cooking and how much moving my body really changed my attitude and how it made me feel better. Um, and I started to do research on why does this impact me in such a way um, and was really introduced to this field of lifestyle medicine. Dr. Mark Hyman was someone who I read a lot of his research and um, is one of the founders of lifestyle medicine. And I was, I was, very set on, okay, medicine sounds right for me. How am I going to be able to find a place that will support this, this interest? Um, and to be honest, like Dr. Stum said, it's not the focus of many medical schools. And to be honest, it's also not the focus at Brown, but I saw that there was an opportunity at Brown and I'm from Boston and it seemed like the perfect place to be. Um, so my thought process was coming in, how am I going to bring this to fruition though in my medical career and in my four years at medical school. Um, and I saw at Brown that there were the opportunities Dr. Stump described. I eventually led the lifestyle medicine interest group um, for a year. I participated in the lifestyle medicine elective, which is so wonderful. Um, and I made sure to get involved with both the curriculum um, as well as talking with patients about everything we learned. So I worked with one of our preclinical um, curricular directors on improving the dietary education and then using what I learned and those conversations with our patients um, and in every specialty. And I'll touch on that. Um, community work is something that I'm gonna highlight uh, momentarily, but that was one way that I felt I could really be um, an active participant in lifestyle medicine outside of just the you know, four walls of a uh, brief patient encounter. And then sharing resources that you learn about in the community with your patients. Um, things like the fact that at our farmer's markets here, you can double your um, SNAP benefits when you buy fruits and vegetables. Those kinds of things patients aren't aware of. So the project that I decided to spend a lot of time working on um, was something with this organization called Progreso Latino. It's a community organization in Central Falls, which is just north of Providence. Um, and it's a very um, 
Latinx community, lots of immigrants. It's, um, it's income is lower than the state average um, and has uh, just a very rich diversity of people from the Latin, like Latinx world. Um, so to say that it's, you know, lots of Dom people from the Dominican wouldn't be accurate. Um, but this, this place, Progreso Latino, provides all sorts of resources as listed here, um, help with immigration, help with speaking English, job training. Um, there is a program for people with prediabetes and diabetes. There's a seniors group to create community for seniors um, and a food pantry as well as childcare for people who have found jobs but are struggling to figure out how to make childcare work. They identified the need for a healthy, affordable, and culturally concordant cookbook for their diabetes and seniors groups. Um, but who has the time to develop that? Well, enter medical students um, who are really interested in and motivated. Um, so as a first year, Rocio Oliva, she's a classmate of mine who can't be here today, and I decided to pick up this project. We heard about the need and thought, okay, let's make this happen. So to do that, we used a community-based participatory approach. So rather than deciding on a top-down, okay, these are some recipes that we can you know, prescribe to patients, let's learn what patients really like to eat, or rather these were community members, but potential patients. Um, let's learn what they like to eat. Let's learn about what some of the barriers to healthy eating and getting exercise are, um, and what are the facilitators and how can we leverage all of that into a cookbook that's something people will actually use and, and find benefit from. So we held interviews with patients. I think it was 20 patients total, or sorry, community members. I know doctors don't mean the same. <laughs> um, community members total. And from those interviews, we um, identified 17 favorite recipes. We partnered with a chef actually also from Johnson & Wales, like in that culinary medicine elective, um, Michael McCooch, to adapt the recipes to be seasonal um, use local produce to um, also leverage things that are affordable, so economically feasible, like frozen veggies. They're frozen at peak freshness and um, can have higher rates of nutrition than um, food that has been sitting there for a long time. Um, and what we learned from that, we developed into both an education and resources section and then these 17 recipes. And that's a picture of one of the recipes. This was actually a great recipe that hardly needed any modification. The patient was like, ah, it uses mayonnaise usually. Maybe you could just use olive oil instead. And we tried and we were like, phenomenal. This is a beautiful like beet salad with cilantro. It's super fresh um, and very true to the soul of the food. The education and resources sections also included um, information about macronutrients, how to modify recipes when people have figured out some comfort with playing around with things in the kitchen, portion sizes, healthy substitutions, um, an example shopping list, basically using the ingredients that we had and pricing it out so patient people had a sense of how much they might be spending in a week or two weeks, um, and then community resources section at the end. Um, there were also nutrition labels available for each of the um, recipes and a section on how to read nutrition labels if people aren't familiar with what to look for. These have been distributed at Progreso Latino and in primary care clinics, as well as through some vegetable um, prescription programs in both Spanish and in English. Um, and the project was supported by Integra Community Care Network with the rationale that basically many of Integra's patients um, would be uh, have access to this cookbook and hopefully find benefit. So here's just a couple of the pages from um, the recipe book. This is the sub healthy substitutions on the left for people who don't speak Spanish. Um, you can see, you know, choosing something like rather than iceberg lettuce, rich, darker greens, um, darker leafy greens have more um, nutrients. And so making those switches, which are simple if people are already making salads. Um, this is a lentil, like a lentil hamburger recipe that was suggested to us. Um, and you can see we tried to provide serving suggestions, have a beautiful salad with roasted veggies on top, top it with avocado and hot sauce. Um, and what has cut off here is all of the directions for how to make it. <laughs> um, so some of the lessons that we learned from this project, it was very interesting because we had definitely, um, 
I think assumed, honestly, that participants were living in a food desert in Central Falls. After these conversations with the 20 participants, we learned that it's not a food desert. There are grocery stores nearby, but the true barrier was cost. Fresh foods were more expensive for these patients, um, or at least understanding how to leverage fresh foods or fruits and vegetables um, to make them in cost-effective ways. There was um, a major component of changing culture. So most of the people participating were either first generation um, or were immigrants themselves. And uh, it was clear how much the standard American diet and that fast paced culture that Dr. Stump is talking about that we all live in has really impacted the um, traditional diet that um, people had come to this country with or been passed down by their families. Um, there, this, these conversations were also taking place in June of 2020. So one of the major themes um, of the conversations was just how much the pandemic had impacted people. Um, people would, some, I remember like three conversations with people very clearly. One woman was tearful that she felt like she was on such a good path with her health exercise um, diet. And with the pandemic, she's been so isolated um, that she just couldn't continue on with that and had gained weight and wasn't getting outside. And so it was very difficult to um, not acknowledge that reality as we were having these conversations and recognize that this level of stress was unprecedented for so many people. Um, I think we knew this before we did it, but it was proved out throughout these conversations that any suggestions for help cannot be these top-down, um, non-individualized prescriptions. They really have to come from a place of understanding around um, what matters to people culturally and to encourage uptake and, um, and really respect, just a baseline respect. Um, one of the big things for the Latinx community is, is incorporating the family. Um, we talked to some moms who were like, they just won't eat what I'm trying to make like these healthier things. And so we were trying to strategize like, okay, maybe we should be holding some cooking classes that can bring kids. And so um, that is something that we're hoping to do as a next step. So um, we have heard from people in, in the clinics that they are really interested in expanding this to include different cultural influences. Like we have a large Cape Verdean population and you know, is the Latinx um, flavor that we have, uh, focused on for this cookbook appropriate, well, maybe we should try and give it a shot interviewing people from um, Cape Verde and, and see what they'd like to see. We'd also like to re-interview the participants to understand how they interact with the cookbook, um, what future iterations should look like, and how we can improve, and then hold cooking classes at Progreso Latino to both highlight the recipes and hopefully bring in some family members. And initially, when we first did it, it was like the peak pandemic wouldn't have been possible, but we're hoping to make that happen before we graduate. Um, and then lastly, for me, just bringing this knowledge to residency, um, the knowledge that there is a need to discuss lifestyle medicine pillars in every specialty. And so I'll just jump into a few rotation pearls. And I, I have no idea if that is like a known phrase, but in medicine, everyone's always teaching you little pearls. Um, and that's, you know, little tidbits of wisdom that you should keep, um, in, uh, keep at the top of your mind when you're on a certain rotation. Um, and so for me with lifestyle medicine, I, I thought about each of these specialties. I thought about primary care, um, and I sometimes still feel a little wishy-washy, <laughs> but I, I want to just underscore that from, um, from specialties as varied as surgery to psychiatry, there is a need to discuss lifestyle medicine with our patients. In surgery, good examples include the benefits around wound healing and post-operative complications. Improvements in nutrition are huge for, for recovery post-operatively. And then in bariatric surgery, I spent a lot of time on my surgery rotation with bariatrics. So it's both helping me prepare for surgery and then also how patients do after because bariatric surgery is not a done deal. It doesn't necessarily mean that patients are going to feel better or improve or stop, stop having their diabetes or hypertension. It's really a partnership between the surgeon, um, the maybe physician's assistant and nutritionist and the patient to ensure that the bariatric surgery actually provides benefit long-term. And lifestyle medicine is huge there. For psychiatry, there's a, like an amazing um, expanding field of um, how 
how diet, the microbiome inter interact with um, receptors in the brain, as well as just day to day, like, like I talked about at the beginning, how much exercise increases your serotonin and endorphins and makes you feel good. Um, so it's very varied and interesting. It gets very much into the biochemistry, but also just um, more macro. For me in OBGYN, um, we see rising rates of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, these kinds of conditions can be prevented um, and they are also harbingers of later um, in life issues. And so I think that for me, with so someone who is mostly going to be taking care of healthy patients who are, you know, in their 20s, 30s, early 40s um, and pregnant, this is a perfect time to talk about making lifestyle changes because who's not motivated by the idea of being pregnant and having a child? Um, and wanting to be there for them. And so making choices around lifestyle um, then is, is a great time to intervene. And then lastly, pediatrics. If you have patients who are coming to you at such a young age, they're very impressionable. You can work with both their parents and the patient to set them up for life rather than uh, being in a position later on where they have to look to surgery like bariatric surgery for help um, because it feels like it feels really hard at that point. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to um, Dr. Stump, and I just want to thank you all for having me. My email is here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to you. Let's see. <laughs> We're having trouble with the with the with the slides. So my last slide is really just very very. Please stay up for me. Um, oh, thank you. Thanks, sir. No worries. Yeah. So this slide is just very um, wrapping it up here, essentially to see like what what we hope to see. And and Megan really highlighted this so well. You know, my future you know vision really for um, these curriculums across the country and undergrad. I don't even want them to start in college. I want them to start, you know, in kindergarten, right? This this needs to be education we do for our society. It needs to be education we do for everyone. It doesn't need to just be for medical medical um, professionals, right? And and students in training. So I would say for medical school though, we need a longitude curriculum, something starting in the first year and fourth year, and requiring like a community project. Um, my residents that I teach that are already doctors, already deciding that they want to go into medicine, you know, I, I train there, I, I love the program, but I'm like, we, we need to get out in the community. We need to do work like Megan's doing. We need to understand the population that we're taking care of. We need to understand what their needs are, because how can we really help them achieve these strategies if we don't understand where they're coming from and what's culturally appropriate for them? So that's what that's where I feel that our direction is. We need to do some teaching kitchens and community health centers. We need to get medical students doing this. We need to get residents doing this. We our undergrads are helping out with this a little bit in the course that already exists. So I think that's the future. Um, this is a national priority. So let's take questions. I think that's where we are. I will say I love these quotes. I'm just going to read them like I'm a classroom teacher because I feel like they're just so powerful. So I wanted to end with Dean Ornish quote. If you guys haven't heard of Dean Ornish, he's a great book to check out. Author of lots of books, including Undo It and lots of other um, sort of lifestyle medicine books. But this quote is really powerful by saying, I don't understand why asking people to eat a well-balanced vegetarian diet is considered drastic. Well, it's medically conservative to cut people open or put them on powerful cholesterol lowering drugs for the rest of their lives. Like pretty, pretty true, right? And then um, Anne Wigmore, who's sort of an advocate of plant-based food, says that the food you can eat can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So with that, let's, we'll take questions. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for a great presentation. Oh. Uh, uh, thank you for a great presentation. But one thing I didn't understand is people are living longer, right? So, um, you know, taking that into consideration, isn't it natural to uh, expect dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, which are diseases of the, uh, you know, when you age more, you get cancer and dementia and Alzheimer's. So isn't it natural to expect that from 1967 to 2000, the two numbers you gave, that people will die more of these uh, ailments because they are living longer, right? So, you know, how do you uh, take that into consideration? Yeah. 
That's a good, that's a great question. And I think it's very true that we do see longevity um, based on a lot of factors, you know, um, don't kind of talk about industrial revolution and all of the factors that have <laughs> happened since you know, the early 1900s, but people are living longer. I'm not sure if they're living better though. And I know that's sort of like a, maybe a cop out answer to your question, but you know, I don't know that, um, you know, the last, you know, not a lot of, if you look at, um, you know, I'm not a, a you know, Gerontologist, like a, a geriatrics physician, but you know, I think essentially I take care of a lot of elderly patients in internal medicine. And I will say that you know, so many of them are doing really well, but you know, so many of them aren't. Like there's 65 year olds that you know are so so ill with chronic conditions, and there's nine. I just saw a woman who's 90 years old yesterday sitting in front of me. I'm like, wow, she looks like she's 65. So it, it there's a, such a large variety. Um, I mean, and there's just there's so so much to your question. I, I think that's very true. I think that's very true. Our chronic diseases have not are, are on the rise from where they were before because we're living differently. So, um, so maybe to mention yeah. Yes. yeah. Good advice for me is like I'm looking to start using the box and you can live longer and fit. Yes, yes, that's a great yes. way to put it. Yes. And I think also when you look at the data on young people, it can be really sad because those chronic conditions are cropping up in 12 year olds. Yeah, which we didn't see as much a long time ago. Hi, uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, how do you, can you list some of the challenges? I'll, I'll stand up. Uh, could, could, could you outline some of your challenges when you treat patients? for whom you know that lifestyle modification is, is great and differentiate that from patients in whom a combination of lifestyle and medications would be more appropriate. So I, that's a great question. I tell everyone that lifestyle medicine is the foundation. So even if I'm going to start them on a statin, you know, there's some folks who, no matter, you know, yes, I would like to say 100% diet, 100% exercise works for everyone, but it, 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 their patients still may not be able to reach those those goals um, with just that, but they can reach them almost, right? There's some people who still need pain medications. Um, and so for that, I always say this isn't an either or. It's not like, okay, you do the lifestyle or you take the statin, right? It's really part of the foundation of, of our medical paradigm. So it's just sort of filling in that good foundation, but it's not to say that they may not need the surgery. They may not need you know, the medication. It's just that foundation. So it really includes all, you know, includes the foundation of the plan. In the front. So um, being a subspecialty surgeon that practices in the fat belt there that you showed on the slide um, and having tried to introduce wellness concepts into the practice for years, you know, the problem is a lot of the patients that are most affected by lifestyle issues are lower education, lower socioeconomic status patients. And in Texas, some of our communities have like, for example, for Hispanic communities, 65% or greater obesity rates. Um, and probably nothing has got me more bad Google reviews than trying to broach these topics. Do you have any data on in terms of adoption? Like assume the physician knows everything, like how to get patients to calorie count. And, you know, in, in our state, probably the average meal out has 2,500 calories. Um, and a lot of patients are 5'2 and, you know, 75 pounds overweight, like how to you know, and I know in, a, in England, an NHS recently stopped approving elective surgery for people who are smokers and BMI over 35 for a lot of orthopedic specialties. Um, you know, what is the approach and, and have you guys tested various like ways of, of getting people to adopt some of these things? Or is there any data on that? Yeah, it's tough. That's a, tough it's a really one. hard question. Um, I would say it has to, like you said, it has to be a culture shift, right? I mean, this isn't just, you know, in the four walls of something that's saying with me and a patient. I mean, that's where it can start. But it has to be, you know, I mean, and, and I think I would say in some fast food restaurants, right, you, or maybe not fast food, all restaurants, but fast food places to eat, like you, you see healthier things on the menu. I do think our society is trying to keep up. You see vegetarian restaurants popping up. You see, you see this movement, but I think how to solve the problem is kind of what we're talking about is education. Like it's like not a one, one solution thing. It's a, it's a pronged approach, right? It's education in our medical schools. It's a national priority, which we're getting there with the national um, uh, movement that I, that we showed last, right? 
And it's also right getting into our communities more, right? And getting the community centers all having programs on pre-diabetes and diabetes. It's you know, spending Saturdays like, you know, in your community sometimes like educating if you're if you're a primary care doctor. Like primary care doctors don't even necessarily live in the in the areas that they work, which is understandable, but you know, part of our commitment to doing this work is understanding our patients and part of part of doing that is understanding what they need. So it's not a good I like there, I don't think there's a great answer to your question. I hear what you're saying. Um I don't I don't know the solution can be just one thing, but I think we're we're on our way. It's 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 a it's a journey, right? So. I would like to look for some data though. I like that question of like, well, what are the strategies that are best best promote adoption? And I think the answer is not clear yet, but I hear you that if you're just, you know, chatting with a patient and trying to do the right thing, um, it's not always well received. Well, there's some, some programs like, for example, Contract, if you're a primary care doctor, will track their hemoglobin A1C blood rate and requirements, right? Mm -hmm. but, but if you have more patients that are more socioeconomic status and more compliant and you get things and it's not like there's then you just encourage them not to see those patients and you create more under supply. Mm -hmm. They, well, that speaks to like the system not being set up to promote health. It's like the sick care system versus the healthcare system. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's the After you. After you. <laughs> um, I had a question. I've got two questions. Number one, how many? Um, what's the percentage of medical students in your class going into primary care? That's a great question. Um, probably, well, it depends on if you count like pediatrics as primary care, because I mean, a lot of those physicians will be generalists, like just take care of kids outpatient. Um, I want to say probably about like less than 20%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, less than 20%. Including internal medicine, general medicine. Right. Exactly. That's that's what I seem to. That's what I see in most medical classes. Yes. We talk about all this, but as he's alluding to, there's just there's a lot of um, pressure, kind of not. I don't want to say pressure, but uh, reimbursement. You're swimming reimbursement issues. How much time? EHR. All the other issues that that primary care physicians have to deal with, which makes it very frustrating. Labor of love. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it makes it tough. You know what you do is, I think, from an OBGYN standpoint, what you can do when you're teaching your teaching those moms how to cook can be pretty powerful because I, I work in a, I work in a hospital. And I, you know, you see even in the cafeteria, the nurses, everybody, when it goes like at breakfast time, they're not eating the healthy stuff. Right. They're all, they're all eating the un, the un, unhealthy stuff. They probably know more than the average person out there what to eat. But I think culturally that's how that is, that is what they've been brought up eating and that's what they eat and they feel fine at the time. Right. So it may not have high blood pressure or it's not bothering them or whatever. So let's eat it. And then it's, then it's too late, you know, 15 years down, down the line. So I think what you do is it, it, it can be quite powerful, you know, teaching these um, teaching these moms. I think a lot, a lot of it is cultural. I, I agree. Said, so. Someday I have a goal of like having my own hospital where we have like a farm next door and then all of the food is awesome and patients <laughs> can just eat what is there because everything is on the table. Everything is nothing's off limits there. Um, but that would be in a different reimbursement system. So, yeah. <laughs> Pay primary good doctors more, let's be honest. Um, yeah. There needs to be less um, electronic medical record charting at night. <laughs> <laughs> Patiently waiting in the corner. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Oh. Okay. You know, I'm an internist in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, I grew up in India. My mom's homemade food, lifelong and healthy eating. Because we just grew up in a well-to-do, well-educated family. And homemade cooking, vegetarian cooking, is the norm in countries like India. Mm -hmm. I come here, the norm is fast foods. I mean, they're mushrooming everywhere. Um, the other thing was, with women studying more and more and out in the workforce, most working mothers, they come home tired and, hey, I'm too tired to cook. Let's get a pizza. See, it is the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It is not just um, what is available, but because the support system here, as 
as a whole is not what is there in Asian countries. And because fast food is easy to get, cheap, that's what children end up eating. That's the taste bud they develop. Right. Some patients of mine have grown up drinking Coke instead of water since they were children. If I tell them to drink water, it tastes bad. It is what you grow up with, is what you, you, what happens later on in life. And if you tell them to eat healthy, that is unhealthy for them. They have never grown up eating that. And that's a whole world out there that is not what you think is normal. And it's not just 5% or 10%. That's probably 30, 40, 50%, 60% of the population that do not eat an apple a day. You know, I tell them, apple a day keeps the doctor away. They don't. They don't eat fruits, they don't eat veggies because they have never grown up eating that. Right. So the mom's kitchen is where it starts. And insurance doesn't pay for nutrition counseling. All these unhealthy patients, they don't pay them so they have to pay out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. So that is a big problem too. There are multiple, multiple factors leading to where we are right now. Mm -hmm. It's just for diabetes and obesity, but what about the pre-diabetes? What about preventing? Exactly. Right, rather than leading to the Wait. point. One study that I'm involved in that's really interesting is identifying screening um, pregnant people for food insecurity and then linking them up with Meals on Wheels. Um, Probably you could argue about the quality of the food you're getting with Meals on Wheels, but at least it is addressing the aspect of food insecurity in um, moms-to-be and um, moms once they're postpartum. So, yeah, we'll look at that, see if that helps any of... the biology of obesity, which of yeah. course we're learning more that once you have become obese, and it's a 42% prevalence now, by the way, right. in 2020, yeah. once you have become obese, yeah. you, you can't just easily just no. lose weight with no, these can't. things. No. It's, There's more gastric bypass surgery. Exactly. There are yeah. obesity drugs, but doctors aren't prescribing them. Insurance isn't paying for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you know, how do you get over that difficulty of how hard it is to lose that weight once you hit the thing with fat cells are just not, they're hanging on. True. Yep. I mean, our whole, our whole paradigm around obesity medicine is shifting now. Even away from BMI, we're learning like in medical school really that BMI necessarily isn't the whole, all, everything. It isn't the end all be all. Um, and I think our society is thinking about overweight and obesity in different ways for, for better. But yes, you're right. There is, a, there is a genetic component. There is a set point metabolism set point that once you get to a certain weight, it's much harder to lose the weight. Um, um, so yes, I mean, very true. I think one way to, that, to frame that with patients who are having trouble shedding weight is that it's not necessarily all about the number or, um, the size of the clothes they're wearing because right. Obesity is an inflammatory state, but if you're eating anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory foods, exercising, creating an anti-inflammatory environment to kind of counteract that, I think there is some benefit to that and to, um, motivating a patient who has found it really hard to see changes on a scale. Thank you all very much. Oh, one last question? Okay. Yeah. Now, um, my son has, my 26 year old son, has gotten as excited about Dr. Sinclair's podcast about people who are obese and fasting. How that's helpful for them. And he has a brain. Telomere length and. <laughs> yep. It's like a positive stressor. It's definitely not something that is taught much in medical schools, but there is interesting data on intermittent fasting that I have kind of done my own rabbit hole dives down. Um, I think that definitely data on increasing telomere length, which is kind of one cellular marker of aging, um, 
it can make people feel really good if you're thoughtful about the times within which you're eating. And um, it's basically if you think of it as like a positive stressor on a cell, um, just the way exercise is a positive stressor. Um, overdoing it is risky. People with um, eating disorders, it can be really risky to dabble in intermittent um, intermittent eating, or intermittent fasting. Um, and then also people, who, who, uh, there was another group I was going to, oh, and um, mm-hmm. women of like uh, reproductive age, it can be hard on your reproductive system. So, yeah. There, there are data for intermittent fasting that, that are coming up because this is a newer area of research. So, you know, studies are, are coming up more and more. There's one or two in American College of Lifestyle Medicine as a research uh, that, that looked at, I think it was either, I can't remember, I can't remember if it's pre diabetics or diabetics, to be honest with you, but it, but it looked at that cohort and they did they did do very well. I think it's a pre diabetics actually, um, and they did really well with weight management through that. So I think I think we're learning more about it, but I, I can't make any sort of large generalizations right now just because I don't have enough data. But I think I think it'd be useful for some people. But I would say tell my patients that they ask like don't don't fast more than like the twelve to four like fourteen sixteen. I think is really the limit. Usually that I tell people it's pretty easy to do 12, but 16 is a little harder. And I think that's usually most most people's limit. Because the problem is then people want to overeat, right? Then they're really hungry sometimes. Then they're then they're grabbing high calorie food. So you just you just have to sort of um, be thoughtful about it, I think. I'm happy to say if if you all want to stay, but I think we'll stay after. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.